Good day and welcome to this uh, GCMS training. My name is Lakim Okoena. I'm the divisional manager um, for the GCMS lab um, that forms part of the mass spectrometry unit that is uh, at the central Antwerp facility, which is based uh, in Stellenbosch, um, at the Stellenbosch University. First, I will uh, talk about the uh, sample prep techniques and then also, I'll also talk about the um, instrumentation based on uh, focusing most on uh, GCMS. The reason for uh, wanting to talk first about the sample prep is because uh, most people tend to uh, forget the importance of sample prep techniques. They only want to focus most on the instrument, bear in mind, bearing in mind that uh, the, only, the instrument can only give the result based on what has been fed uh, into the system. So I will talk about some of the sample prep as we, uh, when we go to that part. As mentioned um, in my introduction, there are some important things that one needs to consider when doing the uh, before analysis when it comes to sample prep. The, the sample matrix is very important. Uh, when we talk of sample matrix, we are referring to the question that we ask, is it uh, based, what type of a sample, is it a solid sample, is it a liquid sample, or is it a gas phase sample? The reason why that is important, uh, um, then it also it can it determine which sample prep you, you will uh, perform. And uh, also, uh, it's important to know the, uh, the miscibility of the sample. Is your sample soluble in an organic solvent or is it an inorganic solvent? Um, if uh, it's an organic solvent, um, um, is it whatever the polarity is, or is it polar or is it non polar? Of course, uh, um, then that will determine, help determine which uh, um, solvent to use. And also, what are the components of interest? When it comes to volatiles, what type of volatiles are, are you talking about? Tapins? Are you talking about uh, alcohols? Are you talking about esters? Because uh, um, it, will, it, it will help you determine what type of sample, whether you do liquid liquid extraction, whether you will do a solid phase extraction, or you do a uh, head phase. Um, are you talking about PAHs? So you might well have to consider uh, doing um, um, catchers. You might have to consider doing um, Solid phase extraction based on the on whether you're working with a liquid or a solid, and if it's a contaminant, uh, um, what type of contaminant are you talking about? Uh, is it uh, is it sulfur based contaminant or is it uh, chlorine uh, contaminant? For example, maybe trichloroanisoles or is it phenolics or which is halophenols? See, uh, sometimes I, when we want to do sample analysis, we just get carried away and then. And we will forget to pause a little bit to ask those relevant questions. I know there are some clients who they come to you, they present to you with a problem, they just want you to find a solution. But if you don't ask those questions, you will not be able to can give the, the, the client the right um, a, a, a solution because you might think you're giving them the right solution only to find that you're giving them something different. So spend, spend a little bit of time with the client discussing what uh, um, they want, and also what is their uh, explanation of, of contaminant. And, and also, I've heard in the past people speak of, uh, uh, um, when they talk of uh, trichloroanisole, they'll tell you, for instance, maybe the wine is cooked. So if, if the wine is cooked, it can mean a lot of things. It does not necessarily mean it's trichloroanisole. It could be that maybe there's some, some TTN, or you've got maybe a vitis spirit in there, which uh, gives the coats cooked smell uh, in the wine, but people think it is trichloroanisole. Also, the volatility of your, of your compounds of interest. How volatile are your compounds of interest? Why is that important? It is important because if your, your compounds of interest are very volatile, so it, uh, um, you may find that maybe you have to keep them in a cooler temper, uh, temperature uh, for you to not to lose your, uh, your volatiles or not to lose your compound of interest because of volatility or maybe uh, um, also, the stability of your sample or, or, or the compound of interest. If your sample is very unstable, you might have to keep it in a cooler uh, uh, condition or maybe do a preparation in a cooler, cooler environment. Or if your compound of interest are very volatile, you might have to prepare your samples maybe in small batches. If you, especially if your lab is not cool enough, your aircon is not performing well, so maybe you might you can prepare all your samples and keep some of them in the fridge up until they're ready for injection. Maybe um, depending also on the 
length of, of, this, uh, of, of the method. And I have to, to just add on your samples, uh, maybe in an uh, hourly period, for instance, it may be your first eight uh, samples and then you the next eight before you go home. And also one other thing that's important, the, the concentration range that you're working with. You know, are you working with uh, milligram per liter, which is PPM, I call it above trace, you can call something else. And uh, um, also, to, uh, um, are you working a trace uh, analysis, which for me, it's a, it's a PPB between one PPB and a thousand PPB, that's trace for me. You can, you can call it something else. For me, ultra trace is anything between uh, I would say in the PPT range or maybe from one PPT to a thousand PPT or even lower, I can also regard it as uh, ultra trace below PPT level. Why is that important? It is important because uh, um, cell frequency working well with PPMs and maybe from one PPM to a hundred PPM, you might have to Maybe dilute your sample be, instead of working at those higher range because most of the instruments are very uh, sensitive at above, uh, above trace at in ppm. So maybe you might even have to reduce your concentration uh, level of the of the standard because for some com for some instrument depending on the compound you might lose uh, linearity uh, when you work at higher concentrations. When you work at a, at a, tra a trace in the PPB level and ultra trace, you can start treating them. Uh, uh, um, Similarly, because you might have to uh, to uh, uh, do um, injection in a in a single iron um, mode, same which we're gonna talk about later, or you can use uh, MRM, sometimes called it SRM. We'll talk about later when you go into the instrumentation part. Also, um, your injection mode that you can use is uh, splitless injection, of which uh, when you're doing PPM range, splitless may be too high. You might have obviously different have to use uh, a split injection. We'll also explain uh, what is the difference between split and splitless. And uh, also, there's an example how to calculate uh, when you're doing a split ratio, how much of the injection you're making. Now, here, yeah, there's been a lot that, that one has to take uh, to consider now. So what now with all this question, hmm, you, one may ask. Now, where do we go from here? All those questions uh, that one has to, to think about, um, which I believe is very, very crucial, is very important. So I will go now into, into the next slide, uh, talk about some few sample prep techniques. As mentioned earlier about some um, sample probe techniques, we'll be look, have a look at uh, liquid liquid extraction, solid phase extraction, solid liquid extraction, head space, and uh, creatures, uh, how they are used and where they are used. Now let's continue with the sample prep. Uh, First, we're going to talk about the liquid liquid extraction. Uh, liquid liquid extraction, if uh, some of you who've done chemistry from level one up until level, until you finish, you'll remember when we were still uh, starting, um, we were doing some uh, um, extraction where we we're shaking, you're having muscles, and if you think uh, think well, um, we were just doing it uh, because we were fascinated, we didn't really know what we we're doing and how important that is. Uh, if you look at the top um, left corner, you'll see uh, the, the uh, separating funnel there and some uh, um, colors. I, I, beg, I, I guess it brings up some memory and then not also giving away your, your age, of course. Um, liquid, liquid extraction in, uh, involves uh, um, uh, uh, um, a water immiscible solvent like your hexane or uh, ether or dichloromethane or chloroform. Um, that extract uh, the analyze from the aqueous solution, aqueous meaning uh, you know, in, in uh, most, mostly water free medium. And then uh, um, you, you shake and then you release the pressure, you shake, release the pressure, and then you, you can, uh, um, uh, you're, depending on what you're using, if you're working with dichloromethane, for instance, your dichloromethane will, will be at the bottom, and then the water at the top, if you're using, uh, Ether, for instance, your ether will be at the top, and the and the your water medium at the bottom. So you can just release depending on where 
uh, your uh, organic solvent uh, says and then also it is important also to consider the, the polarity of your of your compounds of interest i always say it is important to to to, to match the polarity of your compounds of interest with the polarity of the solvents if you're working with polar compounds you obviously have to use a polar solvent to extract them because if you use a, a non-polar so solvent you're not going to get the polarity uh, the polar compounds in in, in it. It, it 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 makes sense to consider the polarity and also uh, um just briefly now, okay, in, in more details about sample, as I say, you've got a sample and you've got an organic solvent, then you're gonna, you, you, you add a certain volume of your organic solvent and you've watered the samples you, uh, for a uh, few seconds, maybe, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Then from there on, you put in an ultrasonic bath or you can use a, 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 um, a shaker so that your, your, your component of interest goes in, into, the, into the organic phase. And then if you're using a, uh, the uh, um, separating funnels, it's always important to remember to just release the, the, the pressure every now and then from the top uh, uh, stopper. And um, after, uh, after sonication, you send with your sample, you separate your organic so uh, solvent, you put it tight. So it's always a good idea to, to do a multi uh, uh, extract. So you might extract two to three times and then from when you're done, you pull all, the, all those extracts together. Because if you do multi extract, you'll, then you make sure that, that, that all your compounds of interest uh, um, are in, in, the, in the polar solvent. Because the mistake that we sometimes make, we think if I'm, I, I'm thinking with, uh, with 10 ml of the sample, I have to add, I have to add the, the whole, I have to all, add the, uh, the whole 10 ml at once. But it might be a good idea to first add maybe a three mil, uh, uh, and you put it aside, and another three mil aside, and, and lastly four mil to get your ten mil, and then you and then you can extract all your compounds of interest. And then uh, also, it is important to add a little bit of sodium sulfate to dry your 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 your, your organic solvent, because the water that might be retained is not good for for, for your for your GC, or it might also uh, affect the sensitivity of your of your compounds. And then what you can also do, depending on what you're working with, or um, what you call maybe the, um, the concentration rate that you're working with, you might have to concentrate your sample uh, with nitrogen, either completely and you consider another solvent, or maybe you can con uh, uh, reconsider up to a certain level. Maybe you you had two mil or one mil or two mil, you can concentrate up to a hundred microliter or maybe two hundred microliter and then put it in an inset and then put it in a GC vial and then your samples is ready for, for injection. Solid phase extraction is a sample protect, sample protect technique by which compounds that are dissolved on a, uh, or suspended on a liquid matrix are extracted according to the physical, uh, physical and chemical properties. If you look at the top right corner there, um, you will see that there's a manifold, and on the manifold right at the top, it's a, those are SPE, and the SPE is, uh, has got what you call a fruit. Uh, in that fruit, that's where your, your, your compounds of interest will be absorbed, and then you can dissolve it uh, or elute it with, with an organic solvent, bearing in mind the polarity of your compounds of interest. And uh, so basically, it's always important that when you get the SPE of the condition with, uh, for instance, uh, um, methanol, uh, you can first clean up, uh, um, first maybe with a, with a uh, leaching solvent to make sure that it's clean, but, and then oh, methanol, and after methanol, you add water. After adding water, um, after equilibrate, equilibrating, you load your sample. After loading a sample, you can wash the impurities with a buffer, depending on the one you're working with, and then you elute with, a, with a, an organic solvent. Um, SPE can, can be used, you can either use it as a sample prep uh, technique or as a sample cleanup. If you're using it as a sample cleanup, so you can put your, 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 your samples on the, on, onto the SPE and you can collect it, the eluent, and then the eluent can, you can take it further. Uh, submit to another sample prep, you have to. But if you're using it as a sample prep, uh, you let your uh, liquid go through, you don't correct it as yet, and then you, after all the liquid has gone through and you've washed the impurities, now you can put uh, a clean vial at the, at the bottom, 
and then you can collect uh, with a uh, organic solvent or or or, or interest and then uh, also you can do on a derivation on the on the SPE in terms of of thiols and other analysis where uh, the derivatizing agent is got added in, into the into the aqueous sample and then and then you elute it and then from the it it it's it on the on the uh, uh, SPE and you elute it so there's a lot of things that you can use it for also bear in mind the polar there's different polarities of the SPE so which you can also find a lot of information out there from the uh, um, supplier of this SPE or you can, one can check on, on, on the internet, there's a lot of uh, information about that. Also now, uh, um, like you did with a, with a, uh, a liquid there, uh, when you're doing liquid extraction, you had, uh, if you had some water phase in, in, in your sample, in your organic phase, if you had some water, you can dry them with sodium sulfate and you can also, as mentioned earlier, you can evaporate with nitrogen to, a, to constitute your sample either to completion or to a certain volume you can transfer it in a vial and you can inject or uh, you can also from there on you, you can do uh, derivatization if you uh, offline derivatization if you're not doing online derivatization so there's a lot of opportunity for that solid liquid extraction um what is solid liquid extraction uh, solid uh, liquid extraction uh, involves uh, where the solid is tra transferred from a solid phase to a liquid phase. A simple example of the so solid li liquid extraction will be when you brew coffee, uh, which involves the mixing of the solid coffee ground with water or a tea uh, when you, uh, from, the, from the tea bags uh, to the water, boiling water. Um, another example is in the herbal uh, um, industry or in, in the other food, uh, various food uh, preparation uh, industries when a vegetable matrix uh, necessitates extraction for, for further processing. It's uh, obviously of fundamental importance to ensure that a high degree of extract efficiency is reached, that the extract is not oxidized and so on. So maybe at the, the time that it takes to do the extraction will, will be important there. Um, and also, many lab process requires uh, solid phase extraction as a preliminary uh, phase of, for, for the preparation of sample. For example, as uh, happens in analysis of uh, environmental contaminants in vegetables, the operation of solid uh, liquid extraction must guarantee that all the analytes are retrieved completely and that they are in no way degraded during the extraction process. Um, there is a uh, um, Currently in the field industry, there are essentially three different solid liquid extraction techniques, which is maceration, uh, percolation, and sort of critical fluid, fluid extraction, which we are going to go further into it, because this was just to introduce to you some uh, um, extraction techniques. Headspace is one of the uh, widely used uh, form of sample prep techniques nowadays, uh, because of the potential that, that it possesses. Uh, advantages you can work with minute samples if you don't have a lot of sample you don't have to use uh, a lot of solvents uh, if you're doing uh, direct uh, SPME and uh, we'll talk uh, also about uh, some SPME techniques uh, like for instance also mentioned uh, um, on fiber derivatization and then uh, SP SPSE we're not going to talk about a lot about that uh, but what I can say about SPSE stands for sterobasal to uh, extraction uh, from what I can remember, um, it was uh, um, developed by, by Pet Sandra, and they had a student from what I remember that uh, they were doing extraction for, for volatile compounds. And then uh, when they did extraction or injection on instrument, they were they either lost, lost of, of compound of interest or the sensitivity was, was too low. And then the student was panicking, and then this, uh, Pet Sandra asked, what are the chances that the compound of interest might be retained on, on the stera bar, or on the magnetic stera, and then they took that magnetic stera, did another solvent, uh, uh, and then they spin in the solvent, and they took the solvent and they inject it, and then they're starting to see peaks, and then they said, okay, right, they can um, now maybe coat the stera bar with different uh, uh, um, uh, t um, tube, for instance, to see if they can. Uh, um, change the, the polarity of that stera bar to attract the compounds of interest. 
somehow this option uh, you, uh, it makes use of 10x use uh, 10x and then um, if you could, if you could have thermal disruption, you can also use the setup bar in there. So when you when your compounds of interest are, are attracted on the setup bar, you can just put it in a thermal disruption and then and then just uh, run and then flush that with uh, organic with an, uh, your, your carrier case and then you, you get your, your your compounds onto onto the onto the um, column and then. Uh, there's different types of uh, solid phase of SPME, like your PDMS, your DVB, a carboxen, um, which is that's a pink fiber, PDMS is red fiber, and then you've got PDMS, uh, um, DVB, carboxen. You know, um, you get different types of, uh, of colors there to have to do with with the with the polarity of the of, of the compound of interest. And um, and uh, um, also the, the uh, fiber uh, uh, the polarity. It's important to match the polarity of the sample and the polarity of, of the fiber. Um, SPM okay, SPM. There's a chemistry uh, of, of the headspace. Uh, there's, it's important to understand that there's a, there's, there is a equilibrium between this, uh, some of the volatile compounds and the headspace uh, uh, coating on the fiber. Um, what happens is that the, the, the uh, compounds of interest get absorbed on the fiber, and then after some time, um, and they, you, the fiber gets inserted into the injection port, and then uh, the volatile gets dissolved into the column uh, through the line uh, by uh, uh, flow. Um, with a um, um, with a um, helium that can be used as a carrier gas, or let me say the carrier gas. Uh, it's always mentioned that the, the extraction time, the solid addition and insertion time, are, are optimized when developing in a, me a method. Uh, the extraction time, it's important that one is, need to uh, optimize it because you might find that for some compounds, 10 minutes extraction is enough. Some 20 or some 30 addition of the salt of the of the salt 10% salt or 20% salt or 30% because when you add salt, the salt helps to, to for the compound of interest to to, to to be to move more into the headspace uh, um, where they are very much comfortable if they are comfortable in, in, in the sample and then also the salt addition also helps to protect the fiber from swelling and the dissolution time uh, um, the most used at the same time is. is uh, um, it's one minute or two minutes, but if you've got, uh, if you don't have what you call, what they call the the the, the fiber conditioning station, uh, if you're not doing automated uh, um, SPME, and then you, one might leave the, the the fiber for longer than maybe 10, 20 minutes in the injection port, because the time uh, uh, after a minute or two, the compounds are already in the into the uh, column. And then all what's left now for uh, that remainder of the times for for the um, fiber to be to, to be cleaned uh, in the ingestion port, and the sample time could also be optimized. Sample time means how much time do you, uh, um, do you take uh, um, to to absorb your 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 your, your compounds for the sample, and also the sample volume. How much volume do you need uh, for the for for that extraction? As mentioned earlier on when I was talking about uh, the SPE, it is also, also important uh, um, with the SPME to condition the fiber before using it uh, because if one does not condition it, uh, one might, okay, when you run or run on the GC, you might see peaks, especially if you've got an FID, you've got, you see peaks and you think maybe it's a peak from the compounds, especially if you're working with unknown, only to find that it's the, comp the compound that one is seeing is coming from the from the bleeding on the, on the stationary phase of the fiber, so um, it is important to condition the fiber before using it. And as uh, every uh, when one purchases the, the SPME, there's, uh, in the box which which uh, they are inserted, there's all there's also a, 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 um, information how to condition and precondition the the fiber. Uh, um, and what to do and what not to do. And I always remember when you condition the, the uh, fiber to open the split vent of the, of, of, on the uh, instrument uh, to reduce impurities from, from the 
uh, by entering the column and also to ramp up the, 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 co the column after fiber conditioning and then make sure that all, all the, the, those compounds which will have been retained, uh, trapped on the, on the column um, are flushed out. Uh, also never ever use uh, a, 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 a glass and, and a liner with a glass will because that will definitely damage the, the uh, um, coating on, on the stationary face of the fiber. And then when working with, with uh, SPMEs, bearing in mind that you're already working with very minute uh, sample because it's on the on the um, column of, of, of the fiber, the liner that one has to use has to be a, a narrow bow liner. Um, the um, anything between 0.75 to 1 millimeter. Sometimes you can even go to 2 millimeter ID uh, 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 internal ID uh, for the for the liner. Also, do not, no, one of the things one must never do, you must never ever soak any SPE, SPME in the chlorine uh, solvent like the chloromethane or chloroform, because they will definitely strip the strip of the, the, uh, the fiber. Um, the fiber will definitely swell and strip. And then, so uh, addition of the salt might help to, to reduce the swelling. So, if one, the question one might ask what if I have to analyze for chlorinated compounds in my sample of interest? So, one might have to, you definitely have to make sure that your sample is in more in a watery media. Maybe one can first dissolve the sample in methanol and then, or maybe in acetone to, to break down the, uh, um, the chloroforms, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the chlorinated solvent, and then also we are seeing uh, maybe uh, I'll add a little more water uh, in the in, in the tap because the most important is not to have more of the uh, chlorinated uh, compounds in there. I just mentioned earlier about uh, when I was int it's interesting the SPME, I mentioned that one can do derivatization. You can do uh, di direct derivatization in a sample matrix, one can do the derivatization in the SPME fiber coating or derivatization in the GC injection port. Um, the direct uh, um, the direct derivatization in the sample means that the, the fiber could get inside the, okay, inside the, um, the, the, uh, the liquid phase where there's a derivatizing agent and then the, the, uh, the, the compounds with it uh, derivative get absorbed in the fiber and then you've got the retract and it get uh, injected on the GC. If one is doing the uh, own fiber the in, uh, the, in the sample, uh, the derivatization in the SPM fiber coating with that, that is the own fiber. So what you can do, you can do the simultaneous derivatization and extraction or a derivatization following extraction. So the simultaneous uh, derivatization and extraction, it's, it's uh, everything together, the derivatizing agent, uh, get absorbed on the fiber, and then on, uh, 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 and then uh, from there on in the sample. So um, like one thing, when one um, uh, working, for instance, with, with styles, uh, when you use OPB, uh, FPR, um, where uh, you, you extract maybe first the sample from your, from your wine with an organic uh, solvent like uh, a, a mixture of ether and pentane, and then you dry your sample completely, you add uh, sodium chloride solution, and then from there, and, oh, let me replace, okay, you do the, um, you, you put a sample, you adjust the pH, you add the, der the derivatizing agent in the sample, and then you, you, you vortex, and then you, after vortexing it, you uh, sonicate, or you, you, you centrifuge, and you take the, the uh, organic sol solvent, and then you take the organic solvent, you dry it completely with nitrogen, and then you add organic, so you get you, um, sodium chloride solution, typically 20% sodium chloride solution, and then you uh, take that vial, uh, you can either do automated SPME or you can do manual SPME, so whatever you take that fiber, you put it on the headspace of, of, the, of the line of the um, vial, and then um, the, the uh, derivatization happened, happened uh, on that fiber, uh, on the headspace, and then you inject, you inject and you, you get your peaks. Next sample prep technique that I want to talk about is, is the question: quick, easy, cheap, effective, uh, rugged, and safe. 
Uh, in this form of, of sample probability, uh, it is a solid phase extraction method for detection of pesticides in, in food. It's used a lot mostly uh, in the of, uh, food industry for pesticide analysis. Uh, the regions used depend on the type of sample to be analyzed. Briefly, how, how are the um, uh, questions work? You've got your sample, you weigh the sample, typically 10 gram or 5 gram or more, depending on, on what you work with. And then you add uh, the organic solvent and the internal solvent, and also add water in there um, to help uh, um, your, your, your sample to talk about. If you just add organic solvent on its own, you might not get the, the compounds out. And then you agitate, and then from there, you know, after that, you add your sodium chloride solution, sodium chloride and magnesium so, uh, uh, sulfate uh, in the buffering um, and adjust the pH. And also you agitate, and then you you, you can uh, take that uh, um, liquid. You can run, you can concentrate up to a certain level, and then you can do a, a lot of other uh, sample prep uh, from there. Uh, if S2, and then you can uh, when you've got that liquid, yeah, you do a GC injection. You can or you can do liquid injection. Um, but also, for instance, uh, just maybe a brief example, maybe like uh, exactly when we're analyzing for for acrylamide in in in, in potato chips, uh, where we weighed the potato chips and then we added water and then we added uh, acetonite salt, and then we found that uh, we were having a lot of interferences because of the of the of the fat. Um, that was in the in the uh, in the potato chip. So we introduced the uh, um, hexane because then the hexane will, will trap all the fat, and then uh, um, the uh, the um, acrylamide, that pesticide, will go in, in, into the um, acetonitrile. By introducing the the hexane, uh, we also uh, improve the uh, um, the sensitivity of, of the of the sample prep, um, because sometimes people think when we speak of sensitivity, the only thing sensitivity is, is instrument uh, related now. They forget that uh, the instrument can only uh, give you what you have, what you have injected. If if you, if you, before you want to speak of the sensitivity of the instrument, one needs to make sure that you've already exhausted everything that you possibly can on your sample prep. A little bit more about derivatization. Remember, I, I, I mentioned about on fiber derivatization when I was talking about the SPME and then also on the SPE. Okay, just uh, uh, a little bit more about uh, um, derivatization. Derivatization is the process by which a compound is chemically changed during a, uh, um, producing a new compound that has properties more amenable to a particular analytical method. Um, some samples analyzed by GC require derivatives in order to make them suitable for analysis. Like, for instance, compounds that have a poor volatility or poor thermal stability, or that can be absorbed in the injector, we will inhibit non-reproducible peak areas, heights, and shapes. Compounds that respond poorly on the specific detector may need to be tagged with a different, uh, um, different functional group. Before uh, doing uh, um, derivatization, it's important that, that, that one needs to uh, um, understand and know uh, um, before choosing a derivatizing agent. Uh, a good derivatizing agent uh, and produce um, process should be it produces the desired chemical modification of the compound of interest and the reproducible, be reproducible, efficient, and non hazardous for the GC and the GC column. Just maybe to, stay, to stop there because, for instance, one we may say that one never ever should. For instance, when you doing a derivatization, when you derivatize, for instance, with any TMS, trimethyl acetylene, you should never ever inject uh, those samples in a polar column because you you uh, um, you will definitely uh, damage the, the the column. So when you're doing uh, acetylation, you have to use uh, a non-polar column. There are all three basic types of uh, derivatizing a, uh, um, reaction, silylation, acylation, and alkylation. Silylating agents react with compounds containing active hydrogens, like for instance uh, in, a, in phenols, 
the, the H from the OH uh, is what they call the uh, the active hydrogen, and or what you're working with, with amines uh, uh, or amino acids, for instance. Um, these reagents are, are the most common type used in GC. Isolating reagents uh, react with highly polar functional groups such as amino acids or carbohydrates like your sugars. Um, alkylating reagents target active groups on amines and acidic hydroxyl group. Uh, multiple derivatives, sometimes one, one might do multiple uh, derivative agent, like for instance when you're working with uh, uh, um, uh, androsterone, androsterone uh, or testosterone. Um, in this multi-step derivative procedure, the, 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 uh, the use of the um, other types of reagents such as oxime, hydrazone, methylation, and cyclic derivatives may be necessary. If one look at if one consider the example of this uh, uh, derivation reaction of androsterone using TMSI with a trimethylsilane and methoxyamine, so what normally what one will do is uh, you'll extract your your, your compound uh, of interest uh, from the sample using whatever sample prep. Uh, uh, um, organic solvent or whatever from, 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 from the water medium or whatever for example. And from there the first thing that you do is you add the methoxyamine. amine. What the methoxyamine amine will do, it will uh, it will uh, uh, go and sit in the oxygen of, of the keto and then it take uh, uh, um, that uh, uh, um, where the, the, oxy, the oxygen of, of, of the uh, acyl group will be, and then it makes it stable. And then you add a uh, uh, TMS uh, uh, in, uh, he, uh, with a temperature heat up, and then the TMS will sit uh, on the hydrogen of the of that uh, OH up there. And then obviously this compound will now have uh, a new molecular weight. So if I get the molecular weight of the compound before the retizing was, for example, 102. If you add uh, 102. You add most importantly is the TMS uh, of which you add that, and and the and the uh, methoxyamine is the one that you that will change the the, uh, the molecular weight. So it's important that when you look on the GCMS that you won't see the initial molecular weight, the formula weight that you see. You're gonna see an additional with the TMS. Uh, it's also important to bear that in mind. If one look at, at, at this. Uh, um, chromatogram here. If one look at, at the top uh, chromatogram, uh, the one which is not enhanced, uh, where you see first, the first peak is, 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 it says 2 and then 1 and then 3 and then 4, 3, 5 and 6. That uh, chromatogram is the chromatogram where there was not a derivative, uh, the sample was not derivative and you can see uh, also pay, uh, look at the, at, at the retention times and how how the, the peak look like. Uh, um, that sample you get very poor sensitivity uh, on the sample um, from the sample when you do GC analysis. Now and then also uh, um, now after derivatizing uh, was it was it was derivatizing with uh, TMS you know look at what happened now with the um, sample with the peak number one. The peak number one has been is well resolved from from, from from peak number two, and then look at the, at the order now. It uh, um, weights goes from from one to seven, as compared to what it was uh, at the top, where you were seeing two. The first peak was was peak number two, and then peak number one, and then you had peak four coming before peak number three, and then obviously five and six. And look at peak number seven, which um, just uh, after twenty minutes, which was not. Uh, 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 we were not seeing before derivatizing. Now one can see the benefit of the derivatizing of derivatizing um, this uh, 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 compounds uh, um, with TMS and, and, and methoxyamine, and then obviously it makes sense that, that you will get a very good sensitivity because of that. If one look at this slide, this slide uh, explains uh, the, uh, um, the slide uh, number 15, uh, in, um, in, in, um, 15 and 14 um, in more detail, um, which is a multi-step derivatization. 
Uh, derivatives can substantially improve the chromatography results as seen in this example of uh, derivation of endosperm in, in the difficult way I, I showed you earlier that uh, uh, you could see now with derivatizing the peak was were higher and, and sharper as well, uh, also including the, the, the order in which the, the compounds were coming. And that uh, androsterone uh, contains a hydroxyl group and a carbonyl group, and that exhibits poor uh, peak shape and poor separation if analyzed and derivatized by, uh, by GC as, as previously shown. Using simulation, uh, the active hydrogen on the OH or SH and the, and the NH groups can be replaced. Since uh, a trimethyl um, imidazole, you can use um, any simulating agent or like a, a BSTFA, MT, M MSTFA. It's a strong saline donor. It will react directly with the hydroxyl group on the endosterone molecule, creating a TMS derivative. Now, the molecule creating a, a TMS derivative. Because Anderson also contains a, a carbonyl group, another difference is needed to improve the chromatic uh, peak separation, which is that's why the methoxyamine uh, will with the carbonyl group for forming an oxide uh, derivative. And then it can not only improve chromatographic performance, but also alter the GC separation. Now, next uh, we come to the instrumentation part. Um, the, the GBS chromatograph um, consists of the injection port and uh, you've got the injection port, you've got uh, the GC column and you've got the, the detection part. And the in injection port, uh, one will talk about the injection mode where you talk of the split or splitless uh, injection or PTV. Uh, program temperature of vaporizer and also the, the type of splitless injection can be the pulse split or splitless and, and some and some um, manufacturer call it the pulse split or splitless they call it the the, uh, pro, uh, the program uh, um, vaporization if, if I'm not wrong um, sorry I beg your pardon they call it a, a, a pressure surge pressure surge uh, what happens there when you do a pulse uh, a split splitless or pressure surge is, is one is what, what you call operating head, head pressure. So from just uh, when your instrument is standing still and then before you do the injection, your pressure is uh, say for case uh, 50 kPa. So if, if, if you do a pressure surge, surge or pulse splitless, you increase the, the pressure, the operating head pressure, maybe up to 200 or 300 kPa for a, a few minutes and uh, before the injection, the pressure can get built up to that and then when the pressure has been reached and stabilized and then the injection happens and then uh, you can keep that for a minute or two, two minutes uh, is sufficient and after two minutes, the uh, pressure will drop down to that operating uh, head pressure that you had of 50 or 60 in the beginning, uh, right through the, the, the uh, injection of, of your, your compound. That also helps to improve the sensitivity of, 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 of your method now based on the instrument. Uh, um, remember when I talked about the sample earlier on, I said, uh, um, one has to try and first try and improve the sensitivity uh, um, from the sample player before one wants to sing the sensitivity it's all, it's also on, on from the instrument. They go hand in hand, but it first with the sampler and then with the other instrument. And then the also under the engine you see with the scepter. The scepter is read as it's, it's there to to help your system to, to, to stay under uh, pressure because if, if you don't have the scepter or if the scepter has got a hole, then you can start losing the the the, the, the uh, um, the compounds of, of interest and that will affect your sensitivity. And the ferrule uh, um, is there to, to keep your column um, intact into the GC on both an injector and also on the on the uh, detector side, uh, whether using FID, whether using NPD, whether using MSD, you still need the, the, that ferrule. A graphite ferrule can be used on the on the injector and on the detector if you're using FID. But if you're using MSD, never ever use a graphite ferrule on the on the on the transfer line. The transfer line is the union between the the, the, the gas chromatograph and the and, and the mass spec. There you have to use a vespel graphite. Normally 85% uh, vespel 
uh, uh, 15% graphite is the, a, bigger, a, a bigger part. Of, yes, Vespa graphite is the best one to use because if you use a uh, Vespa on the on the MSD, because they are very brittle, and then as you tighten the the, the column. Uh, the nut, and then they will start uh, uh, breaking into the into the column, and then you, you lose uh, uh, the the seal. And also, you've got the liner. The liner used is used for focusing. Uh, when you do injection, uh, if you put the liners, which means your, your compounds goes from the liner into into the column. If, if you don't have the liner, uh, the hole is sort of too big into the injection port, and then you lose uh, lose sensitivity, and you don't have focusing. And then now uh, also uh, uh, part of the column, uh, as I said earlier, after uh, the injection port, now you've got the column, you've got to uh, uh, use polar, mid-polar, and non-polar column. So we're not going to talk about the chemistry of, of the, of the uh, column here, because uh, it's, it's beyond the scope of, of this training, because it can be long, but we'll, we can talk a little bit more about uh, uh, polar, because the polar column uh, 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 normally goes up to 250 degrees Celsius. This will be your your, your your inner wax column, your um, stabil wax column, depending on, on, on which supply you're using, or your DB wax, ZB wax, stabil wax, and then uh, um, they uh, they use a lot uh, for volatile compounds, uh, um, like mostly in wine. Uh, if you're doing your your, your alcohols and your esters, uh, this this type of column work much better. And the mid polar column normally they use it a lot uh, when one is analyzing your fatty acids. Uh, um, um, fatty acids, uh, methyl esters, and non-polar column, uh, column uh, uh, this are uh, 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 a very versatile child because you can go up to, uh, depending on, uh, on what column, you can go up to 300, some can go up to 350, 350 degrees Celsius or 325 degrees Celsius because they are stabilized with, with a, uh, uh, with a, um, uh, uh, siloxane, if, 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 if my memory serves me well. And then the GCMS, you've got the GCMS, uh, you've got, uh, which is MSC, is mass electric detector. You've got a single quad, the triple quad, and the time of flight. The single quad and the triple quad uh, do pretty much the same work. The only difference is that with the triple quad, you can do what you call MS, MS or MR. MRM, which you can't do with a single quad, but you can still operate as a triple quad as a single quad, but you can't over operate a single quad as, as, as a triple quad, because you only, can only, with a single quad you can only do full scan uh, um, uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the same, which is single iron monitoring. For you, the triple quad, you can do same, you can do uh, SRM, you can do full scan. Uh, and sometimes you, you can also operate uh, those instruments in both uh, uh, seam scans, so why you don't lose uh, the, the, the the full scan uh, uh, possibility. Because if you only do seam, you can't do a, a, a library search, but that's a disadvantage of, of that. But if you do full scan, you can do a library uh, search. But if you do full scan, uh, you might find that it affects your sensitivity uh, when you when you do quantification, especially if you're working at, at lower concentration. That's why you need uh, a single iron monitoring. So it's a balancing act, uh, in fact, to try and do both uh, same scan because if you do same scan, uh, you all in all you're going to lose a little bit of sensitivity because it's a balancing act. It's also important to choose the right, uh, the correct qualifier iron if you look, uh, working with a sim, uh, a sim and a quantifier iron uh, or, uh, both for sim and also the right transition. To, just to make sure that one does not have, uh, you don't get uh, interferences. Um, sometimes okay, uh, one have to might have to choose a, a lesser. Qualifier iron. If you've got interfering ions, uh, you don't always have to use the higher iron, or you don't always have to use the base pick uh, um, when you when you um, um, qualify uh, um, and quantify. We'll talk about that uh, later. Um, uh, what is the the, the uh, qualifier and quantifier? We'll talk about later. Um, and the the column, uh, just briefly, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the, with the non-polar column, uh, they are made of polysiloxanes, uh, um, 
the, when you once see the for instance HP one or HP five, it, it tells you the, uh, the 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 number of the of the, the siloxane uh, in the in that, and that uh, um, it can it, it can actually uh, it tells you about the the, the the polarity of the of the, of that comp of that column uh, um, the the the, um, the number of uh, polysiloxanes in it. Um, also, the for instance, if you've got a, 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 a DB5 or ZB5 or HP5, it, it means that that five means five percent of the of, of the diphenyl substitution of polysilocent was added into into that column. So what they do is they start normally from a polar column and then they start introducing those polysiloxanes to change it to go to a, to a non-polar column. And as mentioned earlier on, the mid-polar column are mostly most made up of uh, cyanopropyl phenol or diphenyl groups, and these are used uh, uh, mostly for, for, for fatty acids analysis, frames, frames, and also the polar column, which are made up of uh, polyethylene glycol, like your HP5, uh, I beg your pardon, HPFAP, ZBFAP, the inner works, and, and the DB works, as I said. The, the, the maximum they can go, uh, the temperature they can go is, is, is 250 degrees Celsius. If you start going about 250 to 260, it will start melting and then start bleeding into, 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 your, into, into the detector. Splitless uh, injection uh, under the injection mode or injection technique. Um, when one does the splitless injection, everything that you inject goes goes in, 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 into the column, and then uh, um, you get you get higher peaks, and then you, it, it increases the sensitivity of of, of your uh, of chromatography. And um, one uses uh, um, SPME when you're working with, with trace and ultra trace. But anyway, uh, a good injection helps to fulfill the following uh, the following. It allows the columns optimum separation efficiency to be achieved. It allows small but representative amounts of sample to be injected accurately and, and reproducibly, uh, reproducibly, uh, reproducibly. The sample composition must not be changed during the injection. It was not sample based on difference in boiling point, polarity control of the thermal is should, should okay. Now, as I, as I mentioned, the splitless injection is used mostly for trace and ultra trace analysis, where the majority of the sample is injected into the column. Uh, the flow can also be introduced normally at 30 or 50 ml per minute for, for one or two minutes. And uh, um, after this, the split line, is, uh, uh, vent line is open and the bottom of the septum is quickly flushed with carrier gas. Uh, flushing the, the um, the, the um, septa with the carrier gas helps to clean the, the septa and also to uh, um, keep sample that will be on the bottom of the septa from getting into, into GC uh, um, MSN and into the, uh, through the injector and then creating uh, ghost peaks uh, of you. And the other thing uh, um, for, for with split uh, as I said, if you're working with in PPTs and 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 and, and uh, um, lower PPPs, splitless injection will work much better. Um, I always say, uh, uh, some people say, but how do I differentiate between a split and a splitless? It is simple. So if you think of in, in a case where uh, um, the, your, your people are very, very minute, very, very small, and then uh, uh, if you're doing split, if your peak is very, very small and you start doing splitless, uh, uh, you, you can enhance the, that peak. Now, with a split injection, um, a portion of the sample is introduced into the column while the rest is, is allowed to pass or is lost through the split vent. An example of an of a, uh, injection, in fact, uh, before uh, we go to the example, a split injection is an electronic way of diluting a sample. So, in case you run a sample in a split test mode and then your pitch are very, very high and you don't have uh, time to dilute the sample manually, as you can see, one can start introducing what you call a split, maybe a split of 5 to 1, or 10 to 1, or 20 to 1, or 50 to 1, or even 100 to 1 uh, split, but the disarray of, the, of, of high split, uh, running the high split, it means because you're, you're using a lot of carrier gas, and, and, and 
working with helium for this helium is, is expensive so it's a very good it's a balancing act when one uh, working with the split but anyway and a graph of a split rate injection is it's saying that a split rate of one is to two two if you run it means that 50 parts of the sample is injected but only one part of that goes on to the column if the concentration rate of an analyte is for instance 25 microgram of the analyte per microliter and one lit microliter is injected into the column and the split vent is opened before the one microliter injection is made this means that a mass okay uh, you can, one can go through the calculation there. It basically means that uh, um, it says if 25 out of 50 dilution has been made, but the time required is only the software flip of the switch and not manual. Uh, now that uh, if it, uh, now that if it, if it is, a dynamic dilution has been made without actually adding solvent and actually making a, a, a dilution, split engine helps to reduce the sample size to an amount that is compatible with the sample uh, with the sample capacity of the column and also it shortens the retaining time of, of the sample vapor uh, in the liner resulting in a small injection trap so what what happens is, and then you pick uh, when you do a split injection if your peaks were high they, they, they will come down if you had the peaks which are overlapping uh, um, they will be separated for instance if you Right, running a sample and, and then you seeing because I've always asked a question for in the interview. If I always ask a question, I give for instance a chromatogram and say, okay, right, if you with this a chromatogram, I give you one with a lot of peaks, uh, which are not the result baseline. I ask a question, is that one peak or is that two more than one peak? And then it, any answer, it can be one peak, it can be two peaks. And I say, but if you, if it, how will you determine if it's one or if it's more than one peak? And then the answer would be uh, either dilute the sample and run again with a splitless or run a split. So uh, what I'll do, I'll introduce split. If that peak uh, is going to resolve so, and, and then nicely uh, 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 peak shape, then it's one peak. But if, you, if uh, you're seeing more than one or two, three peaks, and then they will be resolved. And then and from there on, the next thing will be now uh, to dilute the sample further. So that's uh, 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 that's how I always explain to, to, to people the importance of understanding the split and the injection, especially for students. Uh, uh, um, that question that I asked earlier on if it's one peak, it can it, it can give a lot of answers. It, it helps understand if if you know what is the difference between a split and a splitless injection. Now the next thing is for us to talk about uh, some basic components of the mass of uh, MS. If you look, if one look at this picture that we have here, uh, you look at the green uh, uh, um, uh, box at the bottom. Um, we've got uh, okay, the sample inlet. The sample will have been come from from the from the column after separation has happened because now the, now the here MS now is it's separating based on the mass change to ratio, and then from the, from from there uh, through the column, you, the sample goes into uh, the compound goes in, into the Iron source, iron source. Uh, that's where ionization happen. Ionization, uh, you can have uh, uh, um, EI electronic ionization. You can have chemical uh, CI chemical ionization, which is an induced uh, uh, ionization. It's a softer form of ionization. It's used mostly uh, um, can, uh, for esters and alcohol, especially if you're not one. It's not seeing a molecular ion. And then one can use a chemical ionization because as I said, you induce your, 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 your ionization and you, you, you set the condition yourself uh, um, of ionization to happen. And um, that happened, okay, and then you got uh, um, the, the mass analyzer where the uh, mass sorting happens, uh, sort, uh, they are sorted based to, to mass change to ratio, and then from there you've got the detection, and then from detection, uh, the ions get, uh, get detection goes into, into, into the uh, mass or you get a mass spectrum and everything happens in a, in a vacuum which you call a vacuum envelope uh, on the MSD The new thermoscientific TSQ-8000 high-performance GC triple quadrupole mass spectrometer offers innovative technology that is both reliable and easy to use the TSQ-8000 GCMS system 
offers unstoppable productivity for challenging matrices with uncompromised MSMS simplicity, automated SRM development, and maximum uptime with vent-free source removal. The TSQ-8000 system features the thermoscientific extract bright source cartridge, the first ever source on a GC triple quad that can be removed under vacuum. All parts that need routine service are contained in the source cartridge, including the patented RF lens, which protects the ion guide and quadrupoles from matrix buildup. The extract bright source also features a repeller designed to overcome matrix burn when it eventually forms. The extract a bright source insertion tool makes it easy to insert the source into the instrument without breaking vacuum. The TSQ-8000 dual heater design delivers heat directly to the ion volume, the lens stack, and RF lens to prevent matrix buildup where ion burn would occur. The source, lens stack, and ion guide are designed so that the negative effects of matrix buildup are minimized this means you'll have high sensitivity and precision on the first injection, but also on the thousandth injection. Ions are first generated by electron impact in the dual filament source. The TSQ-8000 system features an S-shaped ion guide, eliminating the direct path of neutral molecules to the detector, reducing low-level noise. By mechanically eliminating neutral noise, the need for helium use in the mass spectrometer is eliminated, allowing the system to be truly helium-free if desired, reducing laboratory cost and supply pressures. As with a single quadrupole GCMS system, the first quadrupole will eliminate all ions except for the ones with the mass-to-charge ratio of your analyte. However, if a matrix ion of the same mass colludes with your target, a single quadrupole system cannot differentiate the two. With the TSQ-8000 triple quadrupole system, these ions can undergo further fragmentation in the collision cell, creating unique ions. The unique ions are then isolated in the third quadrupole, eliminating the potential matrix interference before moving into the dynode multiplier. This allows you to lower detection limits in complex matrices and enables the operator to combine several methods into one. The TSQ-8000 instrument software makes it the easiest system to realize the analytical benefits of GC triple quadrupole analysis. Newly introduced with the TSQ-8000 system is a new innovative software feature called Auto SRM, which automates the SRM development process to enable you to add your next new compound to your methodology. You can start from scratch, or you can begin with an imported single quadrupole method, and Auto SRM will automatically conduct product ion scans and present your best choices for product ions from which to complete your SRM transition. Once your product ions are selected, Auto SRM can automatically optimize the collision energy for your chosen SRM transitions to within plus or minus one electron volt. Uncompromised SRM simplicity another main advantage of the TSQ-8000 system. With the system's innovative extract bright ion source, proven reliable hardware design, and user-friendly software design, the TSQ-8000 offers uncompromised MS-MS simplicity to maximize the analytical advantages of high-performance GC triple quadrupole technology. To learn more, contact your local sales representative today or visit www.thermoscientific.com forward slash TSQ 8000. The 7000A triple quadrupole GCMS is the first quadrupole MSMS system designed specifically for the unique requirements of gas chromatography applications. These requirements include enhanced selectivity, consistent low detection limits, and robust day-to-day -day operation. The typical MSMS description focuses on the extraction of ions from the source, isolation of the precursor ion in the first quadrupole, dissociation of precursor ion in collision cell, and mass filtering of the product ions in the second quadrupole before detection.
But let's return to the ion source to discuss processes that are often overlooked. Even for a high performance source, ionization efficiency as a percentage of molecules entering the source is very low. This means there are many more neutrals than ions exiting the source. So a thorough description must include analytes neutrals and ions, helium neutrals and ions, column bleed neutrals and ions, and many more neutrals and ions from the matrix at concentrations typically higher than the analyte. To simplify the description, let's start with the analyte molecules and ions. Analyte molecules enter the vacuum source from the GC capillary column and begin bouncing off the hot surfaces of the source. Analyte ions are immediately extracted from the source and focused into the quadrupole mass filter. But what about the non-ionized molecules? The electrical fields within the MS have no influence on these molecules. They follow rapid, random motion until removed by the vacuum pump. Parallel processes are occurring simultaneously for the molecules from the sample matrix and instrument background like column bleed. The quadrupole analyzer performs the critical task of mass filtering to isolate the analyte's ions from the majority of these ions. Chemical noise often remains after the first quadrupole, but the selectivity of MSMS removes this final source of interference. Again, we ask, what about the large population of non-ionized molecules? Although the turbo pump removes many neutrals quickly, some will randomly diffuse into the quadrupole. At the end of the GC separation, the EI source will be flooded with the highest boiling molecules from the sample matrix. Even in a vacuum, these high boiling molecules can contaminate surfaces in the mass spectrometer. A cool surface will accelerate this contamination process. As we think about the potential for contamination, we must not forget helium. The intense flux, high flow of helium ions helps to burn the high boiling molecules onto the surfaces of the source and the analyzer. The cooler the surfaces, the faster the rate of contamination and the faster performance is lost. For an LC atmospheric pressure source like ESI, Metal quadrupoles at temperatures of 100 degrees Celsius are perfectly adequate and commonly used. But for GC-MS-MS analysis, metal surfaces at this temperature will quickly become contaminated. The Agilent 7000A uses a combination of proprietary and patented technologies to avoid contamination problems and ensure robust, high-performance operation. These include an inert source operating at up to 350 degrees Celsius and quartz quadrupole operating at up to 200 degrees Celsius. With 35 years of MS experience, Agilent built the 7000A around the unique hot quartz analyzer of the MSD, not the cooler metal quadrupole rods used for LC-MS-MS. Before continuing to the collision cell, one more process must be mentioned. An EI source produces a large number of highly energetic metastable helium atoms. These highly energetic atoms follow a random path like any other neutral until removed by the pump. Some will follow a path parallel to the analyzer and have a high probability of traversing the entire analyzer assembly to the HEDEM detector. During the development of the 7000A, Agilent engineers realized a small flow of helium added to the nitrogen collision gas was a very effective way to reduce the transmission of metastable helium through the collision cell. We call this patent pending solution helium quenching. A comparison of signal to noise ratio with and without helium quenching shows the benefit of this technology. Helium quenching has no effect on product ion signal, but the neutral noise component is reduced by a factor of four. This technical breakthrough means lower limits of detection and quantitation. The 7000A MS-MS, an MS-MS system optimized for gas chromatography. From the classical distribution of ions produced in the inert, high-performance source, 
to the precise isolation of the precursor ion through the path of the hot quartz hyperbolic quadrupole into the high-pressure hexapole collision cell for efficient precursor dissociation, product ion transmission and simultaneous reduction of metastables with helium quenching, to the final accurate mass analysis in a second hyperbolic quadrupole field before ion collection at the triple axis detector. The 7000A system has been carefully designed to deliver robust sensitivity and reliable quantitative results. The Agilent 7000A Quadrupole GCMS-MS system. An MS-MS optimized for trace analysis of your most complex GC samples. The new standard for GCMS-MS performance. Agilent Technologies. Our measure is your success. Um, some few uh, explanation of the mass spectra of alkanes. Uh, in, in this case, uh, what we're seeing here, it's the mass spectra of uh, of, uh, um, of an bright alkane. Um, here, uh, um, fragmentation always happens from the most simplest uh, is, uh, 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 fragmentation that can happen. For instance, first lose the methyl group and then you uh, the, uh, uh, the methyl group and the ethyl group up until the whole molecule is uh, completely uh, um, fragmented for instance here if one look at the, if the molecular weight of this compound is, is 72 molecular weight of, of 72 you'll see a molecular weight of 72 and then if you lose uh, ch3 which is minus 15 you'll get to 27 and then from then you use the, use this, lose the CH2, CH3 and you get to the 43. So if once uh, uh, you see at 43, the, the which says more stable carbocation ion will, will be uh, more abundant. So what ha that happens is that if you look at the, if you lose CH3 and CH2, what's left in the, with, from the CH3, CH2 and CH2, the positive ion will be, uh, will, will be at that uh, CH2 plus there from the CH3. So there's more than two, three carbons where the carbocate ion can be stabilized, that positive ion can be stabilized and, and rearranged. That's, that's why uh, what the carbocate ion means, and that's why you, that, that's where the high, highest peak will be coming from in, in that molecule because of the stability of the, uh, because of more uh, places where the, uh, the positive ion can, can be stabilized. That's why they call it a carbocate ion. Now, also, if one look now at the uh, mass spectra of the of, of the branched alkane, in this case, two methyl pentane, uh, with a molecular weight of 86, so uh, the fragmentation will happen uh, um, because uh, where the, sim the simplest fragmentation always happens uh, where the CH3 will be lost on the right hand side of the molecule. Um, in this case, you lose CH3 and then uh, um, 86 minus, uh, minus 15 so give us 71. It's always important to remember that the one that you lose, for in this case of CH3, is lost at a high drug. So that you won't see uh, a, a, a tick for that on the spectra, on the spectra because the one that you lost is lost at a high drug. You only see a peak of the positive. Uh, 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 um, that has been left. One case, uh, uh, you'll see the, uh, a tick at, at uh, 71 because there it's from the CH3, CH3, C, CH, and the CH2, and the CH2. That's where the positive will be. So you'll see a peak for that. Now, if you look at that CH2 again, which is another mine, which are another 14, so eventually from 71 minus 14 you get we get to 57 so it, that will come from ch3 ch3 ch and a ch2 that's where the, the positive will and then we lose again that ch2 now we come with what we call a carbocate ion because what's going to be left is ch3 ch3 ch and the positive ion will be on the ch now you'll see now um that's where the 43 comes in You'll see now that the most intense uh, uh, line or most intense peak in there because of the carbocate ion. That's what we call a, 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 we call a base peak, and the base peak comes from the most stable carbocate ion. 
um, because of the stabilization of the positive ion in, in, in that, in that uh, molecule. And then from, it, from there on, it will be uh, um, fragmented, and material is completely fragmented. Because if, if we come back to that positive ion, which I mentioned earlier, see the positive ion can move from the CH, where it's not stable, it can go into the CH3, and when it goes to the CH3, it will be CH3 in the plus, and then you can have a double bond forming, uh, maybe in the second CH3, uh, um, then that will be stable and it can also move around another CH3. That's why they call it a carbocate and there's more than one place where it can be stabilized. Uh, when one look at the uh, um, molecules with, with heteroatoms, your uh, heteroatoms are, com uh, are compound like your bromine, um, on the molecular we will see an M plus 2, uh, M plus 2 is equal to the M plus, M plus 2 it means you will see the molecular weight plus 2 more ions um, and uh, they will be of equal height, you will see when you do an example or two of fragmentation and also uh, if chlorine is present you will see M plus 2 is one third of M plus, so the M plus will be higher, will slightly higher than the, 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 pla the uh, one th uh, plus because of the chlorine, so it becomes a, uh, easier when one look at the at the spectrums uh, when it comes to the next slide. Um, if one look at the, at the spectra of uh, mass spectra of this molecule uh, with this alpha compound. Uh, um, that had a compound sulfur. You see, uh, the molecular weight is 73 of this whole molecule after losing the hydride, of course. Um, you'll see there's two after that uh, intense uh, 76 M plus. You'll see there's two small uh, um, um, ticks there on the right of that. That's where the M plus 2 is there, which M plus 2 is larger, is larger than usual. Now, you will lose. Now, let's go to the If you look at CAH3 there, we have 73 minus uh, 15, and then, uh, and then it will give us uh, um, 61. Now, if you look at, at that uh, molecule, at the spectra there, you can see already the most intense uh, line there is already on, or, 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 or already now onto the, onto the, uh, um, onto the carbocat ion, because why, uh, if you look at CH3 on the left there, You'll see we left with CH2 and the sulfur and the CH3. So the positive ion will first be on the, on the CH2 after losing the CH3 on the left. And then that positive ion can be stabilized by the sulfur, it can also be stabilized by the CH3 that's left on the, on the right. So that's why it's the most intense peak there uh, in, in, in this, in this uh, example. As I said earlier, it's important to understand that. Fragmentation won't happen on the right from the right. It's first going to happen on the left because that's what the most simplest uh, it can be. Because of the, because of the sulfur, the sulfur make it uh, difficult for the molecule to start uh, fragmenting one side. Yes, self fragment uh, away, the further away from, from the heteroatom. Now let's look at the fragmentation where there's chlorine uh, in this molecule. Um, this molecule, uh, the chlorine, that, that the, the CH3 that will be lost first. Before we do the fragmentation, let's look at the at, at the molecular and the M plus. You've got because you've got chlorine, it's got two. But you've got the chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The chlorine 35 is the one that will give you the molecular ion. For in this case, the, the molecular ion of, of 78. Now you'll see there's two small other peaks of which the very last peak uh, or the last tick is the it's at 80 it's because of the M plus 2, uh, because of the, of the uh, atom uh, 37. But uh, the most important one is the, from the atom 35. So now you see if we lose that CH3 from that uh, uh, M, from that 78, you, we will be left with, with uh, uh, 63. And then uh, um, from there on, you, uh, you will see the, the, the carbocat ion will be on, on the on the C plus and your most uh, um, the, the, the base peak will be at uh, at 40 at 43 there after uh, we have lost the, the chlorine 
and then uh, because what's left here it's the, the the methyl the two methyl group and the CH that's where the positive ion will, will be stabilized. When one look at this chromatogram here, um, to us for the analysis of, of, of acrylamide uh, in potato chips uh, using uh, uh, acrylamide D3 as an internal standard, you'll see it. Okay, if you look at uh, the first uh, peak uh, on the left, it looks like it's one peak, but I can tell you, show you that it's two peaks there, and also at 12.7, it, it's also uh, two peaks there. We will see with the next uh, slide uh, when we uh, sort of monitor now the, uh, the, the, the different ions so from the unlabeled and the labeled uh, why I said it's two peaks. As mentioned earlier um, in the previous slide, if you look at the 11.77 minute and the 11.780 minute, you'll see at the top one, it might not be clear, but it's 56, it's iron 56, and the other, the, uh, below that is iron 58, and then you've got iron 71, and also iron uh, 74. It's because of the deuterium lab labeled and unlabeled. The 55 at the top is, a, is from the unlabeled and the 58 is from the from the labeled D3. So sometimes when one is doing uh, analysis on the GCMS uh, using a labeled and unlabeled, you won't always separate the label from the unlabeled. That is why if one is using deuterium labeled uh, um, internal standards, especially if uh, of the same analog, uh, using uh, ECD or N N NPD, it's not going to work because you're not going to separate it, that, that, that peak. So uh, it works in very handy when we're using MS uh, or you do operating in an MS MS uh, uh, here. Um, also at the bottom here, IM71 will be from the unlabeled and the IM74 will be from the labeled. As you can see, they share the same retention time uh, um, of that. So of which uh, the IM55 uh, uh, might be a qualifier and then IM71 might be a quantifier for, for, of the uh, unlabeled uh, uh, acrylamide and then 58 uh, might be the, the um, qualifier for the uh, deuterium labeled and then 74 the, the, the quantifier for, for the unlabeled. So one, one can choose uh, which one to, to use or you can use both and then and you use the, 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 the ratio. But what I normally do, for instance, I will uh, um, uh, um, calibrate and, and, and quantify with uh, with all uh, with both uh, uh, um, the qualify and the quantify and, and, and I just add the um, the results and I get the average. Um, this slide here it, it's a continuation of the previous slide uh, um, where I was explaining to you the the um, the ions from, from, the, from the unlabeled and the ions from, from the labeled, as you can see, uh, 55 uh, uh, and 71 will be from the unlabeled, and then uh, 58 and 74 from the labeled, uh, just a further after I've blown out the, the, the spectra from the previous one. Right here, uh, um, it shows an example of using a single quad uh, in the MS mode and also comparing with the time of flight and the, and, and the MS MS uh, in terms of when using the triple quad. The MS MS slide is going to come after this one, but if you look at these uh, three slides, look at the matrix, uh, how, uh, how it looks like. There's a lot of uh, interferences. The peak of interest is at uh, 23.76 uh, a minute. I mean, uh, um, look how that, that peak look like uh, from that uh, from Quinoc Quinoxifen uh, in hopes. And then you'll see when you go to to the uh, to the uh, um, MS MS how uh, um, it get uh, uh, filtered, how much how better it looks like. And then you'll see there's a uh, just an explanation of how understanding of how MS MS work. There will be two slides, uh, one from from uh, Kimetrix and one from from Themo or the two different triple quads. They explain how to how MS MS uh, uh, um, it, it's done, how it's performed.
And then uh, also with the time of flight, even if it's more advantageous than a single quad, but it still do not distinguish uh, um, a target mass from the peg, from the background. Now look, look at this now spectra of uh, this chromatogram here that you've got here uh, um, of the same compound uh, and you, uh, uh, using the, um, the, the the same and the SRM or MRM. Uh, how how did this uh, peak now that the chromatic looks much better compared to, to the to, to, to the one previously? Triple quad MS MS uh, in a MRI mode. Look at the top one. It says the matrix cut from the chromatogram and the and, and it provides lower detection limit, so you can go lower uh, um, with the MS MS than than you would uh, with the sim. Um, if you with the sim, you are you betting to see, for instance, maybe. Uh, uh, um, 10 ppt. I'm making an example. When you go to the MSMS, you might even go to as low as uh, lower than than one ppt, which is already 10 times uh, uh, higher than that. You can even go maybe to 2.1 ppt, which, which is sub uh, 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 trace. So you that's the advantage of using an MSMS. Uh, uh, the other advantage that you have of, with MSMS, uh, uh, the chances of you reporting a, 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 an interference are lower. Than, than when you do the same. But the reason being that because it's, uh, you might have a compound that fragment uh, um, two compounds and your compound will interact and the, and, and the, and, and the uh, interfering compound, they, will, they might uh, um, uh, um, fragment to the same uh, 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 daughter, but their daughters will, will separate, uh, will fragment differently, uh, um, differently. So, so that, that, that's where the advantage is. If it, I always say, um, if say long as you're working in a forensic lab and and you report the results which were run on the on the uh, on the sim and the MSMS, -MS, uh, your results might not stand if you have to appear in court because the chance of you reporting. The single uh, reporting the interference are higher when using the same than when using uh, MSMS. And also bearing in mind that MSMS, you take the, the, the parent eye and you can fragment it in, in, into its daughters, and the daughters can be fragmented into, into, into their daughters and so on using a, a certain coalition energy. So your chances of, of reporting an interference are, are minimized when using a, 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 a triple quad. This slide here uh, explain, explains uh, the the the, um, the previous slides about the the, the quinoxifen uh, uh, for the uh, for the sim and uh, MSMS for the single quad uh, sim and for the triple quad uh, MSMS. Um, it explains that, that so it, it's self-explanatory. The remaining slides uh, um, from from uh, this. One where we are now, I think it's 45 up until 48. It's some some few troubleshooting uh, um, guide uh, for you when you're experiencing problem. Uh, for instance, if you've got a leak, uh, how to check the leak on the MSD, and you might have to separate uh, um, the the uh, taking in. But I always say. For instance, if you put an air leak on an instrument, uh, it's not always a good thing to start on the MS. You always start from, from, from your sample introduction. For instance, you might find that uh, uh, maybe your, the scepter has got the whole scepter is, is weak, so you'll have to, to replace that scepter, uh, put in a new scepter, and then and then check again, and then and then and then uh, check the air leak again, and then, and then you find that it's it, it, it's. Uh, the, the air leak is gone, or check the O-ring that, that's sitting on the on the on the on the liner inside in, inside the on the injector. Maybe that O-ring needs to be replaced, and then also check on the fittings and all the connections. So that's where that's where that's where you start. It's a, and then if you've checked and this, you still can't find the air leak, then then the, your, your leak it might be maybe because the the, uh, the transfer line the ferron transfer line. Maybe uh, it's cracked. It needs, needs, needs to be replaced, uh, and then, or maybe you might find that uh, there's, a, there's a leak coming from the from from the MSD uh, on the side, the O-ring on the on the side of the MSD. 
needs needs, needs to to be uh, to be replaced or maybe uh, your vent valve is open or maybe the the o-ring on the vent valve needs to needs to be to be replaced so yeah one can you can go through all the slides and then uh, they're self explanatory and if you've got questions obviously you're more than welcome to drop me an email and then i will uh, answer to this uh, um, to all those uh, questions via email We have come to the end of the uh, this uh, uh, training, and thank you for your attention and thank you for for, for taking part. Um, yeah, if you've got questions, you're more than welcome to email me the question. What I will do is I will uh, compile the questions as they come in and I'll answer them in one uh, as one in in another um, in another uh, presentation form. And I hope this was um, helpful for you. Yeah, it's not always easy to do online training when you're not seeing the, um, the the person, and sometimes it becomes much easier when if one explain you're looking at, at the at the people that, that are taking part. So also say must also say this was a learning process. It was the first time that we're doing it like this, and then let's hope and pray that that uh, the uh, things will be differently um, in the new year when we will have got the COVID under control and then we can see each other face to face. There's a lot that, that one can, can learn, learn because this it was only, only scratch the surface of what can do and uh, because uh, um, it's easier when you see the instrument in front of you and then also you ask questions better and then and then you understand it even better. But I think, um, I hope I've tried my best under this condition to try and introduce to you. As I said, it's not easy if you're not seeing the, uh, uh, the people and it's my first time presenting like this. So um, criticism is welcome, suggestions are welcome because you can only improve on that. And then, yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, bye-bye.